Vi är på Göteinstitutet i London och där Axon Jonsson Stiftelsen just har arrangerat ett eh, seminarium tillsammans med The Serpentine Gallery om Hilma av Klint och hennes betydelse idag. Och den första talaren som ni kommer få höra är professor David Lomas som är konsthistoriker vid Manchester University och som fokuserar i sin föreläsning framförallt på abstraktionens botaniska rötter om intresset under sent 1800-tal för livets former och hur man sedan utifrån dem skapade nya abstrakta former inom konsten. Och, eh, ni ska få höra hans eh, utläggningar om hur detta kan ha påverkat Hilma av Klint. Lovely uh, to be here and uh, was uh, quite a surprise for me I must say when uh, to to, to uh, discover that um, Hilma had uh, cropped up in uh, uh, the Serpentine in the middle of uh, London. I'd been sort of following her uh, passage from uh, Stockholm to Berlin and uh, onwards, but that seemed like uh, a few years ago now. So um, it's, uh, it's good to see that the uh, reassessment is continuing. Um, <coughs> The 1985 exhibition, The Spiritual in Art, curated by Maurice Tuchman at uh, LACMA, about which uh, we heard earlier, which um, in fact uh, introduced Hilma Ruff Klint to an international audience for the first time, sought to ally her with an impulse towards transcendence and immateriality, which the exhibition proclaimed as the dominant impulse of modernist abstraction. When um, I was um, uh, initially invited to write about uh, Afklint for the Moderna Musée's uh, major retrospective in 2013, what struck me was the sheer prevalence of floral and uh, plant motifs throughout her oeuvre, including her so-called um, abstract art, a term that um, perhaps we ought not to use without some qualification. The importance of botany and natural history for Afklint is attested not only by the declaration of intent jotted down in one of her diaries, but also some exquisite botanical illustrations which demonstrate not just her familiarity with Linnaean botany, but also her um, pre prodigious skills in precise observation. Part of what compels my interest in Af Klint is the depth of her involvement with science and natural history, which in her day, as much as in ours, was a discourse powerful in shaping indeed transforming conceptions of reality. Without denying her religious and spiritual preoccupations, the artist who intrigues and fascinates me is more firmly rooted in the earth. Okay, the, the question I wish to ask today is how these botanical concerns may have motivated an impulse to abstract. A first clue lies in the fact that Art Nouveau was at its apogee at the time of Af Klint's artistic formation in the 1890s. Art Nouveau, of course, was responsible for an explosion of botanical motifs across the applied and fine arts, architecture, and interior decoration. Uh, that's an installation from the um, National Museum in uh, Stockholm of, and, and uh, some works by uh, ceramics by um, local uh, exponents of this um, um, sort of international, um, sort of European um, style of Art Nouveau. Influenced by Art Nouveau, um, botany in the late 19th and early 20th centuries was the locus of a discourse about form and morphology that had important aesthetic crossovers. Ernst Haeckel, Karl Blossfeld, and Darcy Wentworth Thompson are the most prominent names associated with the subject that also engaged some of the chief exponents of abstract modernism. And you can see the sort of Art Nouveau stylization in the cover of um, Haeckel's um, 
um, a famous book on uh, um, art forms in nature. Um, Carl Nierendorf's introduction to Blossfeld's album of photographs, Art Forms in Nature of 1929, proclaimed, quote, a unity of the creative will in nature and in art. Such views licensed a tendency to extract very general, formal, morphological principles from nature, to, to abstract, in other words. Also relevant to this question is a marked tendency in Art Nouveau towards decoration and stylization, of which one finds evidence in Uff Klint's use of botanical motifs. What I'm arguing for in her case is a positive connection between decoration and abstraction, something that the male pioneers of abstract art by and large energetically disavowed. In uh, Problems of Style, Style, foundations for a History of Ornament of 1893, the Viennese art historian Alwaz Regal traced the evolution of a series of vegetal ornamental motifs, the rosette, the spiral, the tendril, from ancient Egypt to Greece to Islam and thence to the present. Regal tracks the way these forms mutate and transform, seemingly unaffected by culture or history, and with scant regard for models in nature. One might think of Uff Klint as replicating in miniature a development that Regal traces on a much broader canvas, as a result of which organic motifs attain a similar independence from mimesis in her work. The tendril and the geometric spiral, um, two of the forms that uh, Regal uh, examines, happen to be amongst uh, Uff Klint's most characteristic iconographic elements. A delicate sketch portrays the coiled tendril of a climbing plant. A far from incidental detail, its central placement on the sheet, it's like an enigmatic question mark, identifies it as the main subject of the drawing. <clears throat> when we encounter the tendril elsewhere in one of her more abstract pictures, the line thus liberated from naturalistic depiction has a lively, playful character. It dances about on the canvas, encircling other more static forms and animating the composition. The same undulating tendril line transforms eventually into a form of cursive um, calligraphy. In Germs of Mind in Plants, uh, the title of the book of uh, 1905, the Viennese biologist and theosopher Raoul Francais ascribed a primitive intentionality to the tendril. He evokes the tendril as a quiveringly alive prehensile limb reaching out from a vine in search of a firm support that it can wrap itself around. For Regal, who tracks the growth and expansion of tendril ornament from Greek pottery to Islamic arabesques, the self-propagating tendril line seems also to contain within itself a generative force that he designated as Kunstvollen, a, a will to art. In Uff Klint's work, the tendril combines these two senses of a formally autonomous element and an expression of the essence of organic life. Among um, the intellectual currents circulating at the turn of the 20th century, the resurgence of vitalism within biology proves extremely compatible with Uff Klint's pantheistic and spiritual leanings. Vitalism claims that organic life possesses an animating spark or soul that distinguishes it from inorganic matter. It has been disparaged as a, um, quote, biotheology that mainstream science nowadays rejects, but that even respectable biologists at the turn of the century, uh, the turn of the um, uh, 19th century, subscribe to. Francais, uh, a proponent of neo-vitalism, exclaimed, perception and souls in plants. To have spoken of such things 30 years ago would have at once deprived us of the right to be considered scientific botanists. 
The weight of gradually accumulated evidence, he says, has called, caused all that to change. Of relevance to Af Klint, many of these ideas get swept up by theosophy. Rudolf Steiner, for instance, gave a lecture in Berlin in 1910 entitled The Spirit in the Realm of Plants. Another concept that emerges as a concern for aesthetics and psychology in the late 19th century that I also see as being significant for Ruff Clint is um, empathy, the notion of empathy. Its origins lay in 18th century notions of sensibility, the latter coded as a distinctively feminine uh, attribute. Um, the um, English artist George Romney's um, uh, um, um, engraving uh, um, or lithograph possibly, our sensibility um, of 1786 is a portrait of Emma Hamilton reaching toward a mimosa, which was also commonly known as the sensitive plant because its leaves react to touch, a reciprocity of sensitive woman and sensitive plant, in other words. Empathy permits a subject to experience and identify with the unity of nature. Once again, it has chopped through with vitalist presuppositions. Wilhelm Voringer's Abstraction and Empathy, uh, an important text of 1908, famously posited an antithesis between abstraction and empathy. He argued that an impulse towards abstraction was the expression of man's alienation from nature. Empathy for Voringer is equated with naturalism, not the banal imitation of nature, mind you, but an expression of, quote, the organically alive. One suspects um, Afklint would have agreed with Voringer that the purpose of art is to affirm life and the unity of nature, but take an exception to his view of abstract art as somehow life-denying. <coughs> The logarithmic spiral, an abstract form that occurs with such frequency in Afklin's painting as to be almost a surrogate signature, is a distillation of the vitalist impulse in nature. Theodore Cook, the, uh, author of a compendious survey of spiral formations, The Curves of Life of 1914, concluded that with very few exceptions, the spiral formation is intimately connected with the phenomena of life and growth. Logarithmic spirals occur in the arrangement of seeds on a sunflower or a pine cone. A snail shell uh, closely approximates um, uh, uh, to a logarithmic spiral. The spiral, uh, I'd suggest, is one instance of a diagrammatic idiom that one finds throughout Afklint's oeuvre. Science, botany not excluded, was the field where the diagram expanded most rapidly in the 19th century, though Afklint would have been familiar as well with the sorts of diagrams commonly found in es esoteric and occult manuals. The nature of a diagram is to be abstract without being non-representation. Realistic elements are read readily incorporated into its vocabulary. To an extent, it confounds the dichotomy of naturalism and abstraction. I consider the peculiar in-between status of the diagram as being useful for thinking about Afklint's painting and perhaps overcoming some of the problems of simply designating it as uh, abstract. The ambition to reconcile oppositions, above all the duality of male and female, is a leitmotif of Afklint's intellectual and artistic project. In this respect, she stood apart from the prevailing tendency of masculine fin de siècle culture to portray the relation between the sexes in terms of strife and antagonism, and is tantamount to a questioning of the status quo of gender relations in that period. 
Botany, one of the few areas of scientific endeavor that was open to women, came to her aid in the quest to overcome sexual dimorphism. A fellow Swede, Carl von Linné, famously introduced a taxonomic system called, uh, which he called the sexual system, based upon the number and arrangement of pistols and stamens. And I quote, we therefore infer from experience that the stamens are the male organs and the pistols the female. And as many flowers are furnished with both at once, it follows that such flowers are hermaphrodites. A typical or bisexual flower possesses both male and female sexual organs. Goethe's um, color theory, in which blue uh, and yellow comprise a fundamental opposition, their synthesis creating green, uh, complements botany in this regard uh, in um, Afklint's work. I think that can be appreciated from the image shown here from the evolution series, where a stylized floral motif is evidently subordinated to an ambitious symbolic program. The two interlocking circles, like a Venn diagram, is another diagrammatic um, element, um, do I, um, uh, which um, we can um, see elsewhere that um, carries uh, similar connotations of a conjunction of opposites as well as representing the, uh, in, uh, in, in a kind of schematic form, the um, female sex. Um, one of the aims of the Moderna Musée to exhibition was to welcome into the art historical canon an artist who has been undeservedly neglected. My essay ventured a few comparisons with other generally better known artists by way of redressing Afklint's uh, marginalization. Um, and, um, um, it, um, uh, I, I sort of parenthetically remarked here that um, it drew notice at the time that she was excluded altogether from the MoMA exhibition of global abstraction that was showing um, concurrently. Um, Philip Otto Runger's um, um, Times of the Day of 1803, an allegorical series of etchings that rely heavily on flower symbolism and incorporate ab elaborate stylized vegetal forms and arabesques as well as borders, make for an instructive parallel with Afklint's The Ten Largest, the crowning achievement of her paintings for the temple, which likewise represent a cycle of human life allegorically using uh, um, plants. A cluster of watercolors of 19, from 1922 utilize plants as a meditative focus to express a close spiritual and emotional bond with nature. One such image depicts an intense red aura that bleeds from an ear of barley and saturates the surrounding sheet. In 1900, the spirit photographer Louis Darget claimed to capture effluvia emitted by leaves placed on a photographic plate. Like F. Clint, Mondrian was a devotee of theosophy, and his flower pictures, a lesser known part of his output, often suggest a radiating aura, as in this um, dying chrysanthemum of 1908, an ethereal, ghostly patch of pale yellow, its departing soul perhaps leeches from the withered bloom. In Mondrian's case, there is a total schism between his flower pictures, which um, as far as I know, he continued making um, throughout his life, and his geometric abstraction, whereas for Af Klint, there is no such antithesis between nature and abstraction. Odeon Redon is another contemporary who shared her theosophical beliefs and whose work exhibits instructive parallels in its blend of science and mysticism. Like her, Redon taps into the strong association of femininity with flowers in the fin de siècle botanical in, uh, imaginary. One is invited to consider that the abstracted aerial blossoms hovering before the woman whose eyes are shut as if in a 
state of reverie at the projection of an inner vision, an exteriorization of thought forms. Um, the theosophists um, C.W. Charles uh, Leadbeater and uh, Annie Besant illustrated various examples of these materialized visions in their popular book, um, Thought Forms of 1901 by the simple expedient of uh, subtracting the figure uh, um, uh, of um, this um, vision within the frame of the image, uh, the, the figure on the, um, the, the two figures um, uh, in Redon's painting, compelling the artist or viewer to occupy that position of the visionary themselves, a decisive next step would be taken by Uff Clint in the direction of abstraction. Despite the three decades that have passed since the spiritual in art and the increased exposure and public recognition of her work, the place of Af Klint within modern art remains unsettled. Alfred Bard did not, indeed could not, have known about her abstract work, about which, as we know, she was very um, secretive, protective, when he formulated his flow diagram of the development of abstract art for the exhibition Cubism and Abstract Art at MoMA in 1936. Um, interestingly, um, Odeon Redon was included in this schema. Had he done so, he would have found his neat dichotomy of biomorphic versus geometric abstraction confounded. Um, Af Klint exhibits both these trends, shows in fact that geometric order is not alien to the organic world. Attempts to integrate her into any existing category of fraud, exhibiting her in the company of outsider artists, as was done at the 2013 Venice Biennale, I find particularly unconvincing. After all, we're talking about someone whose circumstances may not have permitted her to network with the international avant-garde, but who was an active member of the Swedish Society of Women Artists, of which she served as its secretary. The other evening uh, at another such event, I found myself speculating whether André Breton would have welcomed Uff Clint into the surrealist fold had he known about her work. Certainly she was practicing auto automatic drawing several decades before they were, and it was that experience which was crucial in enabling her to break with an academic routine. Even that would not have been certain, however, because Breton was extremely hostile to the spiritual claims of me mediums, whereas Af Klint um, 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 believed sincerely that her painting was done on direct instructions from higher masters. The understandable wish to see her recognized as a pioneer of abstraction has drawbacks as well. In spite of the parallels that we might discern with Mondrian or whoever, we have to recognize her relative isolation, which was a function of her female gender in a period that systematically excluded women, women from definitions of artistic creativity. Thus considered, her work has the purity of a laboratory experiment in the conditions or, or circumstances, historical, cultural, and social, that enabled the emergence of, of abstraction in multiple foci, not necessarily connected with each other at roughly the same moment in the early 1900s. Thank you. <laughs>